Welcome to part 9 of this Davon Data tutorial series, a Python crash course. The topic of this video is using if-else statements. If-else statements allow your Python code to be conditionally executed. For example, only executing a bit of Python code if a certain condition is met. That is, it's true. You use if-else statements frequently in your Python analytics and data science code. As always, please follow along with this video to learn about if-else statements by typing the code that I type. Don't hesitate to pause or rewind the video if you need to, because you learn Python by writing Python. So I've created a new Jupyter Notebook, so per my usual, what I'm going to do here is rename it. I'm actually going to call this Control Flow. And this is going to be the Jupyter Notebook that I'm going to use for the next few lessons in the crash course as we work through all the various control flow aspects of Python that you need for analytics and data science. So I'm going to call this control flow, click rename, and then per my usual, I'm going to put in a markdown cell here with a big heading of control flow. And then first up in our control flow coverage is going to be if and else. So let's start with a very simple contrived example here. Control flow using if. And we saw something like this in an earlier lesson on data types around Booleans. So I'm going to assign the Boolean value of true to a variable I'm calling A. Very silly name. Don't name your code like this. <laughs> but this is a course. Now here's what I'm doing is I'm saying if A, if the value of A, if the object of A can be interpreted as being true, do everything behind the colon. Otherwise, don't do it. If A is equal true, do all the stuff. Now, here's where things get really super interesting. Python relies on indentation to understand what's going on in code. So again, that's a bit abstract, so let me just demonstrate it. So if I do this, eh, A is true. And if I run this code, we would expect the string A is true being printed out. And that's exactly what we get because we know that A in fact is true. Now, if I do this, and I'm just gonna call it foo, notice that this second line of code here is indented at the same level, which means these two lines of code are treated as a logical block. So we can do something like this and we can run this and of course we get foo. Now, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete that and then show you that because this line of code that I'm writing is not indented, it's not considered part of the if statement. It's not considered part of the if block. So if I run this, I get what we would expect. Now, let's try something a little bit more interesting. Let's say that I have a more complicated situation and I'm gonna create a new variable called B. I'm gonna assign to it the value of false. And then I'm gonna say if B, then print b is true, else print b is false. And like I said, these are some super contrived examples, right? We have to crawl before we walk and walk before we run and so on and so forth. Oop, I didn't spell that correctly, so let's make that print. And what we can see here is the heart of control flow. We're literally saying, do something if b is true, otherwise do something else. And we can run this code and we get back B is false. And now notice this, if I do print foo here, and let's say I do print goo, <laughs> and then print, sorry, I do enjoy coding, end, end of code cell here, and if I run all this, then let's take a look at what's going on here. So these two lines of code right here are most definitely part of this code block that gets executed only if B is true, which we know it's not because we assign the value of false. And these two lines of code right here are also a code block and they are actually executed because in fact true is false. So we fall through this check. We say, no, nope, it's not true. So it's, it's false. So we go to else, then we print these out. And then because this thing is indented all the way to the left, then this is treated completely separately. And even if I don't put this in, check this out. Even if I don't put a blank line in, look what happens. Notice that it's not about the white space that I had before that denotes the code block. It's all about indentation. This is super important in Python. If you don't indent things correctly, 
you're going to get some weird stuff happening, stuff that you don't expect. And rightly or wrongly, that's just the way they design Python. So something you have to get used to. Other programming languages don't do things this way, but Python does. Okay, moving on. So we can actually do really cool, fun things. <laughs> fun with if else. And if you've ever used another programming language or you've used spreadsheet software like Microsoft Excel and you've used the if function in Excel, you're going to be very familiar with what I'm going to write here, which is we're going to be doing nesting. Remember, we can use A because A was run in a previous cell, so it exists in my notebook space, so we know what A is. And we know that the value of A is true. So we can print A is true. Now, notice what we can do here too. We can put another if statement inside of this and say, hey, if C, oops, if C, print C is true. Now, notice the, notice the indentation, right? I got one level of indentation. Both of these guys are at the same level of indentation. But now that I've opened up a new if construct here, a new if statement, I have to indent this line of code. And you might, as you might imagine, depending on the situation in Python, you get a lot of this kind of ragged looking code because of all the indentation, but that's just Python for you. Print A is false. Okay, and then of course, as always, we can do print end of code cell. Now, if I run this, we get exactly what we would expect. Now, here's what we can do as well. We can say, look, let's, let's expand upon this. Let's make this even more complicated. What if I have a situation where I want to check multiple things, but I only want one thing to be executed in the case that it's true and everything else ignored. So we can do that using what's known as elif. So sometimes you want to take only one action. And now what we're going to do here is we're going to make A equal to false. I'm going to change A from true to false. If A print A is true, elif, and this means else if. This is an abbreviation, saves you a few keystrokes, and it essentially says check A first, and if A is not true, check B. And if B is true, then do something. So we're going to do print B is true. And then LF again for C, and we can do print C is true. Now, when I run this code, B is already false. I've switched A from true to false, and C is equal to true. So what we should see printed out here is only C is true. Now, notice if I made, if I turned A back to true again, we get A is true. And notice that A gets evaluated and the rest of this gets ignored. So what this kind of shows you is this ability to say, look, I can set up a bunch of conditions, a bunch of if conditions, and only make sure one of them actually gets chosen. If you're familiar with other programming languages, other programming languages have something called switch. Conceptually, this is similar to a switch. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. Just use elif. Okay, I'm going to make this back to false again, and we can keep going on here. So if and else statements are pretty powerful already, but when you start combining them with logical operators, and, or, and not, that's when you really start taking it up to the next level. So let's go ahead and add a markdown cell here, and we're gonna make this if, comma, else, and logical operators run this. So if, else is most powerful with logical operators. So let's say equal equals true, just to reset everything, b equals false, c equals true. Now I can do something like if, a, and b then print A and B are true. Now I can do elif, right? Else if, elif A or B. Ooh, interesting. A or B are true. Oh, and let's do elif A or C, print A or C are true. And then of course, as always, we can say print, <laughs> end of code sale, end of line for those of you that are old enough to remember Tron. All right, so what we've got here is, is a situation where we run this stuff and we can say, all right, A is true, B is false, C is true. If A and B, no, that doesn't work, right? Because and requires both sides to be true. So this actually evaluates to false. So this line of code right here does not get fired. And then we drop into the LF, A or B. Well, A is true, B is false, but it doesn't matter because with or only one has to be true. So we print out A or B are true. We can see that right here. And then this LF gets ignored because remember only one of these things will be fired in the case where one of them is true. 
And if all of them are false, then nothing happens, by the way, just so you know. That's entirely possible as well. So for example, if I do, um, if we make all of these false, just to show you what happens here, and I run this, then nothing happens because none of these conditions are true. So none of these conditional code blocks are executed. But let's just go ahead and turn these guys back to the original. And there we go. If an else becomes so much more powerful when you start putting the logical operators in there. And we can do all kinds of funky stuff. Like check this out. If A or B or C, print A or B or C are true. Not true or true. There we go. <laughs> And then you can see, of course, I mean, totally makes sense, right? Because all this stuff gets evaluated, usually left to right. If we want to change things around in terms of the evaluation of our logical operators, we have to group them together using parentheses. So moving on, let's take a look at some more goodness here. Use these guys to make code more understandable. I use parentheses all the time in my logical operators. In fact, when in doubt, I just wrap everything in a parenthesis just to make sure that I know things are going to execute the way I think. Let me show you an example. There's actually an order of precedence. There's actually a pattern by which when you mix ors and ands, how they get evaluated. And you can certainly memorize that and depend on that when you write your code. Unless you're the only person using your code, it's just better to just wrap everything in parentheses to make it more understandable. And what we're saying right here is... A or B, this logical condition should be evaluated first. And then the result of that should be then anded with whatever value of C might be. So print either A or B are true and C is true. Didn't capitalize that and it's not even spelled correctly. There we go. And let's go ahead and throw an else in here. Print neither A nor B are true. And I can go ahead and run this. And what we can see here is, yeah, we know from the previous cell that C is true, A is true, and B is false. But A or B evaluates to true. And then that true gets added together with C, which is true. So true and true is true. So then we print out this as opposed to this. Now, we don't have to stop with ands and ors and nots. We can go ahead and mix and match those any way we want to make our logical conditions. But we can also use our comparison operators, which we talked about in a previous lesson. So you can add in comparison operators for even more power, more power. So let's do A equals five, B equals seven, and C equals 21. And now we can do cool things like if A is less than or equal to five, or B is greater than 10, and C is equal, is equivalent, equal equals, is it equivalent to 21, then print, whoa. <laughs> that is contrived code, man. <laughs> okay, if you can't have fun, then why do it? All right, else print, awesome code goes here. Not surprisingly, the first thing gets fired because is A less than or equal to five? Yes. Is B greater than 10? No. True or false evaluates to true. And is C equal to 21? Yes, it is. So true and true is true. So we go ahead and print that out. So what we can see here is that we have a lot of options for mixing and matching all of these logical conditions or comparison operators and all that kind of stuff. Now, this is foundational. I mean, we could spend easily an hour on all kinds of different ways to use these particular Python constructs, but this is enough to get you started. Throughout the crash course, we're going to be building on some of the things you've learned in this lesson, in the previous lesson on data types, around Booleans, and to build and to show how all this stuff works together in the context of analytics and data science. If you're following along, be sure to save your notebook because we'll be reusing it in the next lesson. And don't forget to shut down the notebook. Don't forget to shut down the Jupyter Notebook server if you need to, to free up the resources on your computer. When you're ready to take your Python skills to the next level with analytics and data science, be sure to check out my free crash courses. At the time of this recording, I have four crash courses, one on logistic regression, one on decision trees, one on tuning decision trees. You should really be taken together so that you can actually build useful decision trees, which are a type of machine learning model. And lastly, cluster analysis. With these free crash courses, you always get a PDF of all the slides. You get all the code in a Jupyter notebook. You get any data like CSV files, and you also get additional resources for continuing your learning. They're on demand and completely free, and they'll be ready when you are. If you're interested, you can take a look at either the pinned comment 
or the description of the video, and there will be links to any of these courses in case you're interested. So that's it for this time. If you like the video, if you'd smash the like button, that'd be totally awesome. And if you know somebody that would benefit from this Python crash course, why don't you go ahead and recommend it to them? So until next time, please stay healthy and I wish you very happy data sleuthing.